Why aren't you eating your food, buddy? Why aren't you eating your food? We're not eating guys' food. How do you want to eat? No? Hmm. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's y'all's weekend? Pretty good. Did you do anything? Is there anything to do? <laughs> Megan, are you doing robotics this year? Uh, I'm not. Yeah. I'm trying to build some stuff at home, but I keep getting distracted with other things and not actually doing any work on it. Yeah. So we'll see if I ever actually finish it. All right, um, I guess we're gonna get started. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. I hope you guys had a good weekend and got to take a break. Um, and if people are doing things, I hope you're doing, get, got to do something fun. Um, 
and not school related. I guess school hopefully hadn't gotten started so much that you feel like you're already overwhelmed with work, but who knows, that probably can happen pretty fast for some of you guys, um, depending on what classes you're taking. But um, we are going to finish the last bit of notes from 11.5, and then we're gonna do um, 11.6. Uh, 11.6 is kind of the basics of functions in three dimensions. Um, it's kind of a lot of trying to visualize what you're looking at. So I kind of, kind of like when you guys see y equals x squared plus four, you guys can visualize, oh, that's a parabola that's just been shifted up four units or, um, you know, y equals five times sine x. And you're like, oh, that's going to look like sine x, but uh, it's going to increase um, the max and mins of your sine graph or whatever. So you guys can kind of do that in 2D. In 3D, we're obviously not going to build quite that um, large of a kind of parent graph base. But just so that when you're dealing with stuff, you can kind of visualize what's happening. That's kind of our goal in 11.6. But obviously you have years and years of doing it in two dimensions. And we're going to do <coughs> basically one unit of doing it for one day in three dimensions. So we're not expecting to like know exactly what we're looking at all the time. But just kind of trying to get it to where we have a general idea. That's what we're, our, kind of our goal is here. Okay, so I think where we ended up in, oops, in uh, eleven point five was distance between um, a point and a plane. So I think this is where we ended up because um, I see that we did that over there. So um, distance between a point and a plane. With distance in, in geometry, for example, what we're talking about is the shortest distance between two things. So like if we have a point or we have a plane, yes, we could draw all sorts of lines from the point to the plane, but what we're wanting is the one that's the shortest and that'll be the perpendicular line, right? That's the thing we're really wanting. And so we're gonna call this point Q up here. Um, and all we do to find the distance between the plane and the point, if the, if the plane was like horizontal, that would be really easy, right? We just need the Z coordinate or something. Um, but when the planes are slanted, it becomes difficult to kind of just come up with a perpendicular um, line going through point Q. So the way that we do that is we pick any point we want in the plane. So I'm gonna call that P. And we can usually do that pretty easily. If we've got the equation for a plane, remember that we can just plug in values and get points, just like if we had a linear equation or anything else, um, we could just plug in, um, plug in points, plug in values and get points on the point. So we can get a point really easily. And then we're gonna get vector PQ just by subtracting, okay? Remember that we can subtract um, Q minus P and we'll get the vector PQ. And that's obviously, unless you just happen to pick the right P, that's usually not the distance we're looking for. What we're gonna be looking for is that perpendicular line. We'll remember that also in the equation for a plane, we have what we call the normal vector, N. That's the A, B, and C from the equation of a plane. So all we'll do is we'll get the projection. The projection of PQ onto N will be this thing here. If we get kind of the vertical component of that vector PQ, that vertical component will be the part perpendicular to the plane, which is the part that we're looking for. Okay, so if we take the magnitude of the projection, oops, the projection of PQ on the N, that's what we're doing to get that distance between the point and the plane. So we do the magnitude of what PQ dot N over the magnitude of N squared times N. 
Well, this whole thing is just a constant here. This is a scalar, right? When we take the dot product, that's a scalar. When we find the magnitude, that's a scalar. If I take a dot product divided by a magnitude, that's gonna be a scalar. And remember that we said that way back in one of the first lessons, the magnitude of CV is C times the magnitude of V. Okay, we can pull the scalar out. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. This is PQ dot N over the magnitude of n squared. This part is the vector that we actually still have to take the magnitude of. And then notice I have a magnitude of n and then divided by a magnitude of n squared, those will cancel. And so that leaves me with my formula for a distance between a point and a line is pq dot n over the magnitude of n. And all we're doing, the reason that formula exists is that that's the magnitude of the projection. We just simplify it so that we don't have to find the magnitude of the projection. We realize we have a little bit less work this way. Okay, so that's how we'll find the distance between uh, a point and a plane, is we'll pick a point on the plane and we'll have a point off the plane that we're trying to find that distance. That's the PQ that we're talking about here. N, again is in the equation of the plane. So we don't really have to find n usually, that's already there. And we just take the absolute value of pq dot n because it's a distance, it should not be negative. Um, so we take the absolute value there, which we don't normally do in our projection. Okay, and so that's the formula we'll use. That was where it came from um, before. So find the distance between a point q and the plane. All we'll do is we'll find any point on the plane. And again, that's what I'm gonna call P. We use the equation and you can literally plug in an X and a Y, get a Z, plug in a Y and a Z, get an X, plug in an X and a Z and get a Y. It doesn't matter how you wanna do it. I would plug in as many zeros as I can. So for example, I'm gonna plug in Y and Z are zero and find that point. It, does, it doesn't have to be that point, it could literally be infinitely many choices for a point. But if I plug in y and z are zero, I end up with three x equals six, which means x would be two. All right, so that point is on the plane. Again, you could have done like zero, negative six, zero, or zero, zero, three are also on the plane, and then a, infinitely many other choices. And so then I'm gonna find PQ. So if I do, if I subtract Q from P, I'll have one minus two is negative one. Five minus zero is five. Negative four minus zero is negative four. And then I need N. N is just the coefficients of the variables in the plane. That is the normal vector that we use. Remember, that's where we get the equation of a plane is using that normal vector. So that one shouldn't require a bunch of work. That's three, negative one, two. Okay, it's the coefficients of the x, y, and z. And so then my distance is just the absolute value of pq dot n over the magnitude of n. So if I take the dot product here, I'm gonna have negative three minus five minus eight. And then the magnitude of n is the square root of nine plus one plus four. So I have 16 over the square root of 14, and then I'm done. Okay, again, you don't have to rationalize the denominator. If it can be simplified, that's good, but otherwise you don't have to you know, rationalize or any of that stuff. Okay, so really you can just apply a formula for distance. That's the general idea is we need a point off the plane, a point on the plane, find that vector, um, stuff like that. Okay, distance between two planes is the exact same idea. Right, if I have a plane here and a plane here, it really only makes sense for parallel planes. Okay, if they are not parallel, the distance is going to be different all along them. But as long as they're parallel, we'll just do the exact same thing. We'll take a point on one, a point on the other, and you could think of it as the distance from the bottom plane to point Q, or the top plane to point P, and you'll apply basically the exact same idea. So we'll get a point, on this one, uh, I'm gonna call that P. And again, you, you could pick any point you want, so we could do like zero, zero, three, right? Two, 
times three minus six is zero. We'll uh, get a point on this one. I'm gonna call it Q. And again, whatever point you want, zero, zero, negative one. Any point you want is fine. And then we're gonna do the exact same idea. We're gonna get PQ. So zero minus zero, zero, zero minus zero, zero, negative one minus three is negative four. And then the normal vector can come from either plane because notice they should be parallel. So the normal vector sh on both should be going the same direction or opposite directions. But they, you'll have two normal vectors. They're both going to be perpendicular to each, uh, to the both planes because the planes are parallel to each other. So you can choose either one. It doesn't matter um, since they're parallel, which they should be. Otherwise, you don't ask. You shouldn't be asked to find the distance because it doesn't make sense. If you are asked, that's probably a mistake. Okay, so I'm gonna use the first one, but again, uh, we could use either. And then I'm gonna do the same thing as we did before, pq dot n over the magnitude of n. So that's gonna be absolute value of negative eight over the square root of 14. So eight over the square root of 14. Okay, so distance between a point and a plane, distance between two planes, basically the same idea. You shouldn't, that shouldn't be thought of as two different formulas. Just think of it as a point on another plane and you're finding that distance instead. Okay, distance between a point and a line is actually more complicated in three dimensions. So if we have this line and we have this point Q and we're trying to do the same thing, I would start in the same way. I would just pick any point on the line, which is same idea. You'll have a form of uh, equation for the line, just plug in values and get a point. And I'm gonna get PQ again as well. Okay, and we know that the length of this thing is whatever the magnitude of PQ is. And remember on a, um, on a line, we don't have the normal vector. We have our directional vector, what I'm gonna call U, in the equation. So those coefficients on this one will go parallel to the line. And so think what we, um, want here is this side okay this is what we're calling the distance and so if we had that angle we could use that so think like sine theta is our distance that we're looking for over the magnitude of pq so our distance is sine theta times the magnitude of PQ. If we take that and we multiply both sides by the, well, this is fine if you've got the angle between PQ and your line, which technically you could find that angle. This is one way you could find the distance. If you only have the vectors and you don't wanna to have to kind of work backwards, find the angle and do all this, we could multiply both sides of that thing by the magnitude of u. Okay, and that should be also true, right? I'm just multiplying both sides. Oops, this should be times d, sorry. I'm just multiplying both sides by um, the same thing. If you look back at, um, I think it's in 11.4 notes. This is equal to the magnitude of the cross product of U and PQ. I'm not gonna put that, that looks like I'm dividing. This part is equal to this. That was one of the things in our properties, the geometric properties, is that the magnitude of U cross PQ is equal to magnitude of u, magnitude of pq times sine theta. 
And so we have a distance formula that we can use that only involves the vectors. It's the cross product of u and pq, find the magnitude, then divide by the magnitude of u. So both of these will work. Okay, this will work. You could do it this way if you want to find the angle first. But that first one only deals with um, the vectors themselves. All right. So find the distance between the point and the line given by these parametric equations. Again, I'm going to come up with a point that's on the line. Oops. Point P. <clears throat> I'm going to do that just by plugging in T equals zero. So it's going to give me negative two, zero, one. And then I'm going to find PQ, same as I did on the plane problem, subtract Q minus P, and I'll end up with five, negative one, three. This time U is the parallel thing, but that's the thing we want. U is the coefficients of the T's in our parametric equation. That's the three, the negative two, and the four. And on this one, I want PQ crossed with U. So remember with our cross product, what I'm basically gonna do is I'm gonna cover up the first column. Okay, by cover up, I mean I'm gonna cover up these numbers and then I'm gonna multiply um, across and subtract. So I'm gonna do negative one times four, so it's negative four, minus a three times a negative two. So that's negative four plus six is two. And then I'm just gonna move that thing over and I'm gonna cover up the middle. This is, oops, this is our determinant. Remembering that this next one is the sign switches. So it'll be 20 minus nine, which is 11. And then I'm gonna move over again. And I'm gonna have a negative 10 minus a negative three, which is a negative seven. And then my distance is just gonna be the magnitude of that thing. So the square root of four plus 121 plus 49 over the magnitude of u square root of nine plus four plus 16. So that's- um, Mr. Smith, I can't see what you're writing. Oh no, it's not going anymore, sorry. Thank you for pointing that out. Let me stop, sometimes I stop the share and then restart it, it'll show up. It's like something gets delayed. Uh, all right. <laughs> So I have square root of 174 over square root of, one, of 29. Okay, so I do the cross product and then I just find the magnitude of those things. You technically could try and figure out the angle between PQ and U using the formulas that we've done so far and use the angle to also find that distance if you'd like. Um, they, they both will work there. Okay, and so that's basically it from that section. Distance between simple geometric objects, lines, planes, they're really formulas. Uh, as long as you can apply the formula, like you know P is just a point on the plane or the line, Q is a point off the plane or the line, you're really just applying formulas there. So again, I don't really make you memorize those. So as long as you can apply them, you should be in um, okay shape. Okay. So we're gonna to move to 11.6. Okay, again, this is gonna be surfaces in space. Um, I don't really make you memorize stuff, so you don't have to memorize this, but again, you're just trying to get as much understanding as possible. Think of it in calculus. The more you understood the function, the easier the calculus would be with the function. We're not even really doing a lot of calculus right now. We're kind of doing the building blocks of three-dimensional space. Um, so think in two dimensions, our equations would describe things like curves, parabolas, sine curves, whatever. Um, in three dimensions, when you write an equation, you're going to get a surface. So if you go to a 3d graphing utility and you put in y equals x squared, it's not going to graph a parabola. 
if you're in a three-dimensional graphing software, that's going to graph a surface. Um, so if we want curves in three dimensions, like we want our parabola, you have to use things like parametric equations, which we'll do more later. But just like a line is not y equal 2x plus 5, in three dimensions, a line is going to be the parametric equations. Same thing if you want like a parabola or a sine curve. You're going to have to do parametric equations. Because if I write something like y equals sine x, that's not going to be a curve. That's going to be a surface. Okay. So um, we're going to go over kind of three types that we're, we're going to kind of want to have a general idea of, again, general understanding. So first one is called a cylindrical surface. A cylinder would be a good example of a cylindrical surface. Okay, what you have is you have a generating curve and then parallel lines called rulings. So there are lots of examples. In general, I would say if you see an equation with only two variables, it's a cylindrical surface. So like y equals, uh, let's do, I think we're x squared is one or the other. I can't come up with something better off the top of my head. X squared. The, the two-dimensional thing you think of is y equal x squared. That's the generating curve. So when we say generating curve, in this case, it would be a parabola. Okay, and then we have to think z can be anything in that equation, right? X could be 1, y could be 1, z could be 5. X could be 1, y could be 1, z could be 20. X could be 1, y could be 1, z could be 0. All, all three of those points make that equation true. Since there is no z, z could really be anything. So what we have is that parabola at every z value. So if you were thinking about how to graph it, if this is z and this is y and this is x, we'd have that parabola in the xy plane, but we'd basically have that parabola at every single z value. So the rulings will be parallel to the z-axis. You basically picture that you've got this surface. Think of it like um, a folded piece of paper, okay? If folded like a parabola. That's basically what you're having here is this par parabola sheet going everywhere where you've got that exact parabola that you guys are used to in 2D at every single z value. Okay, so it's kind of the general idea behind a cylindrical surface. So like for us, a basic cylinder, our generating curve is a circle. Okay, so you could think like uh, x squared plus y squared equals four. And you have a, two, a circle with a radius of two. Well, in 2D, that graphs as a circle with a radius of 2. In 3D, that'll graph as a cylinder with a radius of 2. Because at every z value, I will have an identical circle. Okay, and so then I'd have these things called rulings that would just basically connect and create the, the outer surface is if you like could draw infinitely many of these little rulings, the rulings are going to go parallel to the z-axis in this case. Okay, and it's going to create the surface of the cylinder. The only difference in 3D is if you graph x squared plus y squared equals 4, it's got no top or bottom. It just goes on forever. It's an infinitely hot, tall cylinder. So generally, if I see two variables, that's kind of what I'm thinking here. So like this is a cylindrical surface. You should look at that and think, boy, sure looks like a parabola. Z equals Y squared. Okay, and then again, this is Y, this is Z, this is X. Z equals Y squared will basically be the parabola that we're used to in the YZ plane. But notice, since there is no X, it means that parabola I'll get that identical parabola everywhere on the x axis. 
and so my rulings would go parallel to the x-axis. Oops. To create kind of the outer shell of the surface. So just like my first uh, random example that I came up with, this is going to be kind of like if you got a sheet of paper and folded it in a parabola shape, you're getting this surface that's like you took a, a parabola and just stretched it in the in this case in the x direction. So like our generating curve is a parabola. What you'd think of this thing as a 2D thing and the rulings will be parallel to the x axis since that's the thing that's missing. That's where the rulings go. The variable that's not there, the rulings are in that direction. Okay, since my drawing skills are pretty terrible, this is what it looks like in a graphing software. Okay, z equals y squared. It's this is in the this is the x, the y, the z. It's just this folded parabola sheet of paper or sheet. Knowing that it it extends infinitely up this way and out this way, unless you put bounds on it, it's going to go infinitely in all directions, just like a parabola does or whatever. <clears throat> Okay, and then I put the little stripes. Those are the rulings, basically. We go in and parallel there. Okay, and so we could do that with all sorts of things. If you see a two-dimensional looking thing, like z equals sine x from zero to two pi, z equals sine of two x is a sine curve in the xz plane. Okay, so we'd have this sine curve this is z and this is x in the xz plane and then since the y's are not there you'd picture that that same sine curve could be anywhere along the y-axis and then the rulings would just go parallel to the y-axis and again i'm not grading your graphing ability my graphing ability is not so great a little bit aided by the fact that I can get straight lines with my uh, iPad drawing software, but you're basically getting kind of these rulings going this way. And so this one, you picture if you put a ripple in a piece of paper, that's the surface we're seeing as this kind of rippled thing. It's a full sine curve from zero to two pi. <clears throat> um, and just kind of doing that little curve. So again, 3D graphing software, which you guys, if you have a Mac, Mac Grapher has 3D graphing software built in. It's called Grapher. Otherwise, you literally can Google 3D graphing software, and there's tons of um, free graphing software if you want to use it, if you want to be able to visualize. So like this one I turned a little bit so we could see it better. Here's the X, the Y, and the Z. I just tilted it. But you can see it's basically that sine curve that we've got going. Um, in the xz plane if i turn that exactly where xz plane was kind of flat parallel to what what we're looking at all you'd see is the sine curve and then if you tilt it that's where you'd see that that same sine curve is all anywhere on the um, y-axis okay surfaces of revolution these we actually talked about last year right we basically talked about revolving curves around axes or whatever and generating something we only talked about it in terms of volumes and surface areas and things like that but like we could revolve this around the y axis and all we're talking about is that at any point um i'd have a radius that's determined by that generating curve so again this has this thing called a generating curve and we just picture that anywhere along the curve, I could kind of picture that if this thing's revolving around, I've got all these disks, which is where we had the disk method and the washer method. I've got all these disks. Um, the, the radius of them is determined by that curve. Okay, so again, these ones visually, you should have a little bit more experience thinking about. It's like, that's this thing. I didn't restrict the domain, but there's the top. Um, so in this case, <clears throat> those circles, are kind of those disks that we're talking about. The generating curve would just be the function. And so with these, the equation comes from the fact that all of them have cross sections of circles, right? If I just to slice it, I'm gonna end up with a bunch of circles. And so we use the equation of a circle to come up with 
um, the equation for these functions. So remember the equation of a circle is like x squared plus y squared equals r squared or whatever. Those would be circles parallel to the xy plane, right? x squared plus y squared equals r squared would give me circles parallel to the xy plane. So like if we're revolving around the z-axis, that's parallel to the xy plane, our circles. So like that's what, where that bottom one would come from. If we're revolving around the y-axis or the x-axis, I need circles in the other plane. So like the x-axis, I want circles in the y-z plane. Right, if I wanna be um, going around the x-axis, my circles should basically be parallel to the xz plane. Or if I want to be in revolver on the y-axis, they want to be parallel to that. So, I mean, parallel to the xz plane, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> so then the radius is determined by the function. This is just the generating curve. And remember, the radius of each circle is going to be the, um, formed by that generating curve. And we literally plug it in X and Y, or in this case, Y and Z squared, or X and Z squared, or X and Y squared, those stay the same. And you literally just plug the function into the other side. So for example, um, if we want the equation of that surface, Y equals one over Z about the Z axis. So again, here's Y equals one over Z is this, um, rational function in the Y Z plane. And we're just revolving that thing around. So since I'm doing the z axis, I'm going to do x squared plus y squared equals r squared, in this case, 1 over z squared, or x squared plus y squared equals 1 over z squared. So if I graph that thing again, if you went over to a 3D graphing software, that's going to graph as this thing that we're looking at here. So these should be pretty easy. Again, you, you don't have to memorize. You just have to have that, um, the notes somewhere that you can actually use them uh, and then kind of plug in what you want. So like revolve the equation of the surface formed by this uh, 9x squared equals y cubed. Okay, so that's basically a function that it'll look like this little, almost like a cone, but it's a little flared out. Uh, think if you had, this is y equals what three x to the two thirds. So I basically have my y equals x to the two thirds function, which if you looked at your parent graphs, that's this thing. It's that little, not a V, but a V with again, curved sides. That's what you're revolving. Um, so since we're going around the y axis, I want x squared plus z squared. And I want a function of y squared. So I have to take this thing and make sure I have a function of y, which means I don't want to use this. I want to solve for x. So I have x squared equals one ninth y cubed. So x equals plus or minus the square root of one, well, y cubed over nine. And the plus or minus won't matter because remember, we're going to square that thing. So I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to get x squared plus z squared <coughs> equals y cubed over 9. So you really could have stopped here since we're plugging in that thing squared. So that's the only way that this could get a little hard to come up with is if your function's not solved for the correct variable. Since I have x squared plus z squared, that last thing should have y's in it. So you need to solve it for whatever um, that is. Okay, the last one is quadric surfaces, and this is essentially big, a big list. This is probably the ones we'll encounter the most. So think uh, Algebra 2. Does that when you do conic sections, Algebra 2, or do you do that in pre-cal? I don't know. Um, think back to whenever you guys did conic sections. It's basically, you know, hyperbolas, circles, ellipses, parabolas. It's anything that is of the form ax squared plus by squared, cxy, dx, ey, f, I could plug in zeros for some of those, but I'm basically getting combinations of x squared, y squared, xy, x, and y. 
and constants. Okay, and I have my basic things like ellipses, parabolas, hyperbolas um, in 2D. Okay, this is all, that's technically review. Um, you should be really familiar with circles and parabolas. I would say pretty familiar with ellipses. In my experience, hyperbolas are the things that you guys are worst at. Um, probably are the things you guys have encountered the least. It's just like an ellipse equation, but one of the uh, things is negative. Okay, so quadric surfaces are the 3D versions of that. So we're just gonna add Z in, which means we'll have also a CZ squared and a combination of things with Z squareds and XZs and YZs and Zs in it as well. Okay, which means it will have more types. So we had four before, we'll have six of these. We usually visualize them using traces, which are the cross sections parallel to the main planes. So picture what it looks like when it hits the XY plane, meaning Z is zero, or when it hits the YZ plane, meaning when X is zero, or when it hits the XZ plane, meaning Y is zero or whatever. We kind of picture what it's happening there because otherwise it's kind of hard um, to draw a lot of 3D stuff. So we're gonna have six types and all, they'll all be listed on each of them, but there's an ellipsoid, hyperboloid of one sheet, hyperboloid of two sheets, elliptic cones, elliptic paraboloids, and hyperbolic paraboloids are our uh, main types there. And so even in there, you can kind of see like an ellipsoid has something in common with ellipses. So do elliptic cones and elliptic paraboloids. Hyper, hyperboloids, and hyperbolic paraboloids, they have things to do with hyperbolas and parabolas. So the, in the name, you can see um, that there's relationships there between the things that we've seen in 2D and these 3D things. Those relationships are the cross sections. Okay, so an ellipsoid is usually the easiest thing. Okay, similar to the 2D equation for an ellipse, Okay, this is our 2D equation for an ellipse. To get an ellipsoid, we literally just add a Z on in the same pattern. So if we add a Z squared over C squared. <clears throat> okay, so notice we're essentially starting with our ellipse. The A and the B, remember, represent kind of the distance from the center in the X and the Y. Well, now the C will represent the distance in the Z direction from the center. Okay, so we have these um, ellipsoids. It's basically a sphere is a type of ellipsoid. If A, B, and C were the same, you'd have a sphere. Ah. Okay, and so what we mean by this traces in this picture, the XY trace is if we just took the slice that's in the XY plane, it's an ellipse, right? Basically, if we plugged in zero, that's our ellipse equation that we already know. If we plug zero in for y, we'll have our xy trace, which is also an ellipse. If we plug in zero for x, we'll have a trace in the yz plane that's also an ellipse, okay? So that's all we mean by traces is what if we plugged in zero for each or parallel to that, we'd have the ellipses as well. If you sliced parallel to any of those planes, we have ellipses. So usually people have the easiest time with this. It's easy to visualize. It's just a um, distorted sphere. Um, basically you have all the variables are squared, added together. Um, notice we, our normal form is this equals one. If I multiplied by a squared, b squared, c squared, well then it'd clear those um, denominators so you could have something like 4x squared plus 7y squared plus, you know, whatever, uh, 3z squared equals something else. That could, that's gonna be an ellipsoid if you just divided and got one or whatever. Okay, so um, in our normal form, we have that one there. Okay, second one is called the hyperboloid of one sheet. One sheet being, think about if I were to make a model of this, I could make it with one sheet of paper or one sheet of material. Um, and it's similar to the 2D equation for a hyperbola. So x squared over a squared minus 
y squared over b squared equals one. We get a hyperboloid of one sheet by again, adding uh, z in the same pattern. So plus z squared over c squared. Okay, and really we could get it in all sorts of directions. We could make um, any of those negative. So like if you just switch where the negative is, it's just gonna rotate it around the origin. It's still gonna be a hyperboloid of one. Sheet. Okay, so these are all hyperboloids of one sheet. Notice the main thing you're looking for is you have that ellipsoid equation, the same exact thing, but one of them is negative. Any one of them is negative and all it's gonna do is kind of rotate, <laughs> stop. God. All it's gonna do is rotate it. Okay, so the one that I graphed is the Z is negative. And notice that's gonna mean it's gonna open around the Z axis. If the Y is negative, it's just gonna rotate it so it opens along the Y axis. If the X is the negative instead, it's gonna rotate it to where it's gonna go around the X. And so notice one trace is, is an ellipse. In this case, the X, Y plane, right? If I plug in Z equals zero, that's the equation of an ellipse. The other ones are hyperbolas. If I plug in X equals zero, I have a hyperbola. If I plug in Y equals zero, I have a hyperbola. Okay, and notice those are the sides, are those curved hyperbolic sides. So it's like a little um, cylinder that's kind of been pinched in. Okay, but one sheet, meaning I can make it out of one sheet of material, right? I could kind of make a model of this thing out of one sheet of material. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna go a little bit fast because we're running out of time again. Hyperbo hyperboloid of two sheets. This one, the way I think of how this is, it's gonna be made out of two sheets of material. And you have the same starting point. If I had x squared over y squared minus, I mean, sorry, x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals one. I'm gonna get this thing by doing a very similar idea, but instead of adding the z squared, I'm gonna subtract it. So minus a z squared over c squared. So I start with that hyperboloid, I subtract, and again, I could make the negative um, in other places instead, but notice it, this one just needs two negative ones, one positive. Oops. So I could put the negatives with the X and the Y, with the Y and the Z, or with the X and the Z. And like the other one, that's just gonna kind of change the orientation. But these would all be hyperboloids of two sheets. Two negatives, two sheets. One negative, one sheet. And so if I graph it, it's kind of like the last one, but it's like I completely pinched off the center. So like I took that cylinder and I kind of started pinching the center. Here's if I went ahead and just finished and pinched it all the way off. Um, and so one trace is an ellipse. So again, in this one parallel to the X, Y plane, I'd end up with the ellipses. I won't have one at the center, but because think if I plug in Z equals zero, negative X squared minus Y squared can't give me a positive one, right? That's never gonna happen. But as I move away from the origin, as I start plugging in like Z equals 10, subtract it onto this side, then I'll have the equation of, a, of an ellipse or a circle. Okay, and then the other ones are hyperbolas. All right, we're out of time. We'd only have a couple left, so I'll just finish those tomorrow and it shouldn't be a big deal. But um, you could literally look at the notes. It's just kind of a bunch of formulas. So we only have three left, but I'll go over those tomorrow. Um, yeah. You guys have a good afternoon. Your problem set's due Friday, similar to last week. Um, so nothing, no huge rush there. But if you want, you can get started on your problem set because you have two of, we finished two of the three sections that are on the problem set on Friday already, 11.4 and 11.5. All right. You guys have a good afternoon and I will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Bye, guys. Thank you.